Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. I work at Sea Alaska Heritage. My name is Rochelle Smallwood. And um, my clean introduction is It's my pleasure to introduce to you two incredible artists, uh, Perry Eaton and um, Alvin Amazon have joined us today. They are both amazing artists and they are both Olympic in Zubiak. And if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves in your native language, that would be perfect. My primary language is English. My uncle tried to teach me Olympic and he would give me a word. And about 10 minutes later, he would throw his hands up explain to me I was an idiot and leave. So uh, my name is Perry Eaton uh, from Kodiak. Uh, originally the family is from Uzinki and I'm a member of the corporation of Uzinki and Koniak and a member of uh, the tribe, Kodiak tribe um, and an artist. Oh, I'm Albert Ames, oh Chumai. I'm Albert Ameson and family's from um, Kodiak and Chignik and uh, Years ago, Fognak and uh, Benilchik. And uh, so, yeah, hello. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for your introductions. The first question I have is um, if you wouldn't mind telling us the differences between Aleutic and Anungan art. I know there's a lot of. Um, Gray area in southeast. So, if you wouldn't mind elaborating, that would be great. Uh, I, I think when the Russians uh, found us, yeah. uh, uh, they lumped uh, all the all the people on the coast together, and so they, they I think they call us refer to us all as Aleut. And uh, matter of fact, when we were we were younger. We thought of ourselves as Aleut, and and as time went on, and there was more education, uh, discovered that our, our language was different. That if you've ever met a real Aleut, they're different. You know, they look different, bone structure, everything. Can't understand a word they say, <laughs> and uh, uh, so it became obvious that uh, we are different different people. Although a lot of the marine technology is very similar. Very similar. Uh, and a lot of the harvesting and, and use of medicines and everything. But uh, uh, yeah, we are, we are uh, distinctly two different people. The church was the first to distinguish between the two. Uh, orthodoxy uh, came with the Russians and uh, the conversion was uh, pretty complete, but it was uh, St. Herman or Monk Herman at the time uh, that actually uh, differentiated the first time between the people. And he was on Kodiak and he clearly dis had, had two different, he, he knew there were two different people there and he distinguished between the two and he worked with the locals a lot, but the, the Anungan that came were hunters. Uh, they didn't come with their families, they came with, with the Russians. And so it was uh, this hunting class of Anungan that he was exposed to, which was different than the family community life of, of the Aleutic, Aleutic on the island. And uh, when uh, the history uh, of the uh, mission in Kodiak was written in 1837, uh, he spent considerable pain. Let us take care of that. We're in, we're in our studio here in Anchorage. We're in Magpie Artworks. And uh, so it's an ongoing working studio. And that was our compressor that just kicked on. Uh, but we, we took it out. But, but St. Herman was the first one to distinguish clearly in writing the difference between the two groups. And then it was relatively lost during the Americanization period. And people were really lumped into that bucket of, of uh, Aleut. Uh, which neither the Anunga nor the Spiak really appreciated, but that's how we identified ourselves. And, and then we were Russian. 
Oh, I've been to lots of things. Okay. Half breed Russian, Sukhjak, I mean, you know, you get you get your choice if you come from Kodiak over history. I don't know if we answered. Oh yeah, well, yeah, did we answer that question? <laughs> Perfect. I know you both are artists as well as doing some educational work as well. How have those two things gone hand in hand for you? Um, I've, I've kind of retired from the educational thing recently, but uh, did 17 years at UAF running the Native Arts program and then established one here in Anchorage uh, at UAA for 10, 11 years. So I found the, uh, the, the routine complemented work. I, I'd work at the university and then I'd come in and work here. So uh, I found it kind of spiritually rewarding to be around young people and, and uh, help them build their toolbox and, and uh, work with ideas. And it kind of very seldom was it draining, although there were days like that. Uh, but it was, you get a little bit charged up and it's a pretty, it becomes a village. And uh, I don't know how else to put it. So I, I do a lot of workshops. Um, and I, I really like working with, uh, you know, six to 10 people kind of a thing where you really have a lot of really hands on activity. Um, the people that are interested in indigenous art, the, the motivation runs a pretty big spectrum. Some want to learn just you know, they're, they're not indigenous, but they want to better understand uh, through art. And uh, that's kind of one group. Uh, then I was very, very privileged uh, to be uh, able to put the Native Heritage Center together here in Anchorage. And I was uh, the, the president and the CEO during its actual construction and, and uh, was involved in the developing the curriculum around that educational uh, interface between the cultures. And that was that was really quite quite rewarding for me. Uh, in informal uh, teaching, I really like. I, people people will come here, friends, relatives, uh, other villagers, and they'll visit. And, and you know, they might ask a question about a technique or something, uh, whether it's maintaining tools or sharpening or, or all of those kinds of things. We're always eager to help. We, we're blessed with a studio to die for. I mean, we have 18 inch bandsaws, 14 inch bandsaws, dust collection systems, sanding systems. I mean, we, we literally have here uh, a dream, a dream come true. And we share, people will come in and, and they have a block of wood that they can't cut on their 14 inch bandsaw. We'll always make our equipment available and, and, and teach. And that's that's fun, and, and we've had neighbors. There's been other artists here in the area that uh, have been. And Drew Michael, uh, one of the great contemporary uh, Yupik artists, uh, used to have a studio next door. And there was a real learning, teaching, interaction kind of activity. I think it goes with all arts. I mean, I I really enjoy sharing what I've learned. Yeah, you don't own it. <laughs> It's just absorb it and pass it on, I think. Some, some, some artists are very possessive of technique or, or whatever. Uh, but I think from an indigenous standpoint, it's inherent upon you to share that. It's just, it comes back all the time. Yeah, it, it, it's almost a requirement of being whole. Well, that's, yeah, really important to make sure that that information gets shared with the, the next generation. But I know it's tricky now with this new virtual reality we're living in, is how do we make this accessible? Do we make it accessible to everyone or only to our people? So I'm wondering if you either of you have any advice for passing on your knowledge. That's a debate we've had. I, you know, when it, it, it's really difficult, one of the greatest compliments in the world is to have your work plagiarized. <laughs> I mean, you know, if, if somebody else comes along and says, your work is so good that, that I want to be like that, 
in a way that's a compliment. In another way, it's a theft, um, particularly in design. Uh, design can be very proprietary. Uh, it can be collectively owned by a group. Uh, it can be owned. Uh, I, I question whether it can be owned by an individual, but it can belong to a village. It can belong to a clan, a family. Uh, and, and when it's used in context, I, I think that there is a proprietary sense. If it's used in a commercial context, I have less heartburn with that. But if it's used in a family ceremony or in a traditional song, or it's only, it only comes up when you, you, you elevate a, an individual to, to, to achieve, or it's, it's, the utility is set around that particular presentation of object. Then I, then I, I really, you know, I, I, I don't think it should be shared other than visually uh, with the community. But I, I, we, we have artist friends that are very, very possessive, and they get very upset if somebody copies a style or something. I don't have any problem with that. You know, I've copied a lot of people just to get where I build up my toolbox. I have a problem with it. Um, and then I've, I've had, oh, my wife or daughter will come up and say, you know, that this person's trying to paint like you. And I, my gut feeling first time was, well, it's impossible because no one's that sloppy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and not, not even worried about it, you know. And my, my work is masks and, you know, they're tools for transformation. And uh, they're used uh, repetitively. Uh, and so if someone carves a scene mask that's similar to mine, uh, that's very much within the context of the culture. Uh, and and my, I don't think of my mask as an original work. It's, it's a cultural presentation interpretation by me. And uh, it, it's sort of like Santa Claus. Where's the original? And, and who's, who's right? Is it Coca-Cola Santa Claus? Is it uh, St. Nicholas out of uh, Scandinavia? Uh, and, and so it, and it's repetitive. It's, it's over and over and over again. And much of the utility of indigenous art is repetitive as a utility object. So to make like and similar pieces is perfectly normal. You can tell uh, if you get familiar with a, a certain artist. You, there's so many nuances that make up what's called style. Yeah. You know that you can kind of have a feeling. You know that that uh, so and so did this. And uh, I, Nathan Jackson called me a week ago, and he he said that he likes to talk to his other Southeast partners and in, in making stuff, but. Uh, so I felt like calling someone out of the region. <laughs> so anyway, I told Nathan, I said, you know, I, I can always recognize your work. I mean, yep. I, I can spot it. I mean, I'm not going to define it like he is. A, his primary is black and heavy and bold. But uh, I said, usually when I walk up to look at the label, I'm right. And without, because I, I can just tell by the nuances that so that's, a, that's a Jackson piece. You know, and I, I think that goes with, well, most artists. Right, so silver work, for instance, Amos Wallace, I, I mean, you can see one of his pieces from across the room. Yeah. Is it black and similar? Sure, but it's his interpretation of that, that piece. So, yeah, I don't, I don't get heartburn when people copy my work. I, I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, on that note, I would just love if you'd elaborate a little bit on the nuances that make up your style. What, what would you say it is or isn't that um, I've heard a style is all the things you notice in a painting, and, and those are the things are the things that you for 
there, that's what makes up your style. So would you two elaborate a little bit on what makes up your style? Go for it. Oh, makes up. I think um, what's really important to me is attitude. And, and when you walk in a studio and you've, you've got blank canvases, all the colors mixed up and, and you're in a good attitude, and you might put on Bruce Springsteen or something, whatever kicks you, you know, and that's a really good place to be, you know, and, and there are other days and it shows in the work, you know, and you could start out with drawing, but all of a sudden you're just kind of flowing. And, and, and if you can maintain that level of painting from the gut rather than trying to overthink it, it's a lot more fun, you know, and, and it's, it's what I call, you start and then you start going sideways and all of a sudden it's a whole new journey, you know? So uh, personally, I, I have a general idea, but, but uh, I have not really a clear picture of what I want to end up with. Let's see where it goes. Yeah, but Alvin, your, your style, number one, you do depth with color. You use color for depth. Yeah. And you're brilliant at it. I hate to tell you that, but. You are. Hey, louder. <laughs> right. uh, I mean, I come into the studio and you'll be working on a piece and you've just laid two colors side by side and all of a sudden the bear is alive. And and bears don't have any orange, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and But that color control is a style you have. Uh, and, and then your three-dimensional aspect. You've taken the canvas and you've pulled noses, birds, and you put a three-dimensional piece to that in a manner of style. And you could paint that just as easy, but that sculptural piece really differentiates your work. It, it really is, I think, style, uh, very distinctive. I mean, you can walk in any museum, any airport, any hospital in the state, and you can look at a piece of work and say, oh, <laughs> Alvin did that. It's very distinctive. Your color genius is really good. Oh, sure. Sorry. I've never told you that. Oh. No, that's where a lot of the work comes in is trying to control color fields. Just make the red recede, make the blue come forward. You know, it's kind of the opposite of what you were academically thought. You can do it all. It just takes a little work, you know. When I first saw Alvin's work, maybe 20 years ago, uh, I thought, my God, he just throws Anybody could do that. And then I've watched it being produced. And trust me, not everybody can do that. Uh, I can't. Uh, the, 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 I, I think the, the hallmark of your work is color, color control and, and the ability to build depth with color. That's just, and I guess as a black and white photographer, you know, where I'm just using shades of gray to bring forward, to use color to do it is, is really quite impressive. My style, I, I painted in my early years. Um, I did three-dimensional sculpture, um, but there, there was very, no, there was no native art on Kodiak Island when we were kids. There was literally nothing. Our museum was a Quonset hut. It had an old seal oil lamp in it, a big one. A rock, yeah. And then it had a kayak that had skin on it, but it was an alley kayak. It wasn't even from Kodiak. Even Kodiak. That's all I remember in that museum. That's it. A few, a few rocks, baskets. Right. And there were some baskets. bone points that yeah. somebody found. And, and so there was no inspirational stuff. There was nothing to tie us to a lutic culture. And yet we both grew up on the fishing cleats. Uh, we were out all the time on the island, and, and that just becomes part of you. Uh, and so you see it, you see the animals, the eagles, the, the otters. I mean, it's all there every day in front of you, the weather, and, and, and it's really important. But I became totally focused after the passage of land claims. All of a sudden on the island, you, you sort of had to raise your hand and say, oh, yeah, I are one. Now, what does that mean? And so you can't have culture without art. 
There's just no culture without art. So the, the logical conclusion for me was, all right, if we had a vibrant culture, where's our art? And so I was very fortunate to be able to, I was traveling the world. I was working in a wide range of activities. And so I was in Russia. I went to a museum in Russia, the Kutzkammer in St. Petersburg, walked down a hall and there was over 800 Aleutic Kodiak Island artifacts. I, 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 I was stunned, absolutely just, my God. And, and it, was, it was like a starving person at a smorgasbord. There was so much to look at, so much to absorb. And the masks really, really fascinated me. And uh, because they're so telling, they're, they're utility objects that act in a belief system for transformation. And for me, it was sort of a baseline. So I started studying the masks. Uh, there was uh, some in Russia, maybe six or eight, depending on how you want to count them. And then in France, there's a collection of, of over 75. And then in Spain, there's four. And, and they're all over the world. And so I started traveling all over the world. And I have gone and found every Aleutic mask that I know exists all over the world, in Europe or whatever. And you study them and you start to look at them. And, and then when you begin to create, you, you learn. Um, our art was produced differently, for, for instance, than Southeast, than, than Indian art. Indian art is carved with a knife and, and it's an object you hold. Ours all have a flat back and they were all made with pushing tools with the, the wood mounted or secured and, and it was done with a pushing tool, which was, was completely different. Uh, we had a lot of pumice, so they're sanded very nicely. Um, the, the, the collection in France all came out of a cave at one single point in time in 1872. So it's a wonderful uh, piece in time. We're so fortunate it stayed together as a collection. And that's been my influence. And, uh, and I've sort of tried to stay, what I call stay in the box. The masks I make all have flat bags. They're all made in that manner and in that style. And I like to think that if someone sees a piece of my work, they can associate it with a Lutic culture. And so, so that's kind of a goal and sort of a, a baseline or a track that keeps me focused. Oh my, yeah, that is amazing just that you're able to make so many discoveries about your culture while finding that. We're starting to get a few questions from the audience, and I just wanted to remind everyone, if you have any questions for that you would like me to ask the artists, please type them below in the comments. And also, if you wouldn't mind letting me know what community you're in. That way it helps inform the artist's response. So our first question we have is from Kari and, uh, and she's located in Juneau. She's wondering, has your approach to creating art changed since you started? If so, why and how? Can you repeat the question? Yeah. <laughs> how has your how has your approach to creating teaching art changed since you started? If so, why and how? Approach to teaching? How, I guess production. How, oh. How has it changed since you started? Your approach to teaching and creating art. Mm. But wow. When the problem is when did you start? Yeah, I took my first art lesson when I was eight years old. Um, and it was in watercolor and I hated it. So I changed right away. Um, how has it changed? I, I think it's just nuances. I, I, I don't think all of a sudden there's a big change. It's uh, uh, you'll discover little things that make production easier right like working smart 
as yeah, working as smart. Helen Simeon actually says they work smart. Yeah, you, you take care of your stuff. They make it more accessible. Uh, you don't store brushes and paint thinner like this. They bend, lay them down in a roller pan. Gee, that took me 10 years. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, there's there's just little things that, that make uh, that, that wash you get into when you walk in the studio and your head's in a good place makes the production so much easier. Uh, and I think you, you, you pick up those things all, your whole career, you know, and it, it, it affects your teaching. I mean, you know, while uh, I remember, I think it was last year, I was at a couple of new girls in class and they were trying to do something. So I showed them really quickly. I mean, it was such a no brainer to me, but they were just amazed. And yeah. they just said, gee, you're smart today. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's a cumulative uh, over time. I, I think materials have changed. Yeah. I remember when I was uh, painting, I was using casein paints. And you, I don't even think they sell them anymore. Uh, acrylics, when they came in uh, with, with the vibrant colors that you could use. I think assimilating to the new, the new tools. I mean, uh, the technology today, just the internet, uh, the ability to share, discover, research, uh, communicate has changed, and I think that has affected uh, some of my art. I, I I post stuff on Facebook. What a novel concept! Uh, you know, twenty years ago, you didn't do that. Uh, so. So, I mean, staying, staying pace with the modern world, which, which sort of brings us to the moment. I mean, I, I'm not sure where indigenous art is going to go in its many facets with the current situation. Um, I, the country is broken. No matter who you talk to, no matter what side they're on, what issue or everything, they'll tell you that it's, it's wrong and it's broken. It's very divided, um, and and that has to play through, because I mean, as an artist, I'm always emotionally moved by those things around me. I mean, I'm only a, a, a sum total of my experience, and so we're going through a very novel, unique experience uh, in many, many facets, uh, and 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 art will be impacted. It can't not be because our culture is in a very rapid state of change in the, in the exact moment. So, um, yeah, that's a real question. But, but I, I think art evolves. I think artists evolve. And, and you change subtly. Um, you get impatient with people. I mean, teaching is a good example. Um, there are people that I've worked with a long time and I've found that they're just takers. They, they take up your time and, and they don't learn and they just want the same lesson over and over and over again. Um, and, and you have to draw the line and, and they're fine folk and they're good friends and everything, but you just have to, I have to push them back. Alvin says that I'm too agreeable. People come in and I spend too much time with them. Yeah, teaching is both formal and informal. Getting back to the change over time, um, I think I recently went to Fairbanks and, and uh, went to the museum and saw an old piece they had that I hadn't seen in 20 years. And it's really fun to go up to something like that and, and look at it and, and think, how did I do that? You know, I don't remember how I did that. <laughs> it's kind it's of so fun, true. you know. <laughs> so, it, it, yeah, that was kind of fun. I see stuff I did 25 years ago, and I look at it and I go, oh, that's what I did. You know, yeah. just, or, or what was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, that's, uh, hmm. Great, we have another question from Alana Amazon and she's wondering, how do you get ideas from each other using different mediums? 
we don't play off each other all that much. No, but uh, if you make a comment like, I really like that part there, I really pay attention to it. You do? Yeah. I'll be damned. Yeah. Uh, because I didn't hold it in such a steam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so all of a sudden I, I start paying a little more attention. So I, I think that kind of relationship, I already forgot the question. Uh, How do we play off each other yeah. and, and get inspiration? Yeah. And then when I look at your stuff, I, I pay attention to first impulse, you know, whether I'm looking at a beak or a color or something, it's, I really try to pay attention to what, what hit me first. And, and the rest of me are all kind of secondary. Uh, and I, it's just a habit I've gotten into, you know. Well, I'll, I'll come to you for color. Yeah. I'll see a color in a magazine or I'll see a color over here someplace and I'll, I'll go to Alvin and I'll say, How do you, what, what do you mix to get that? And he'll just give you the formula, you know, that's, that, that, that's handy. Um, I, I like looking at his work. Now, we're very unusual. We've shared a studio now for 10 years. Longer than that. Longer than that. We've never had a crossword. We've never been in an argument. We've never had a disagreement about the studio, the music, or anything going on. And that's very rare. That's like finding a hunting partner or a shopping partner. They're very rare to find a perfect one. And we were just lucky. It was nothing that we planned. We just, and, and so there are days we come in here and Alvin will walk in and I'll, Alvin, and, and that's maybe the last word I have that day for Alvin. I mean, we'll, we, we live in, Two very distinct, the studio's divided into two areas. We share common equipment. Um, and I do my carving and my mask work on one end and he does his painting on the other. And, and it's worked very, very well for us. I, I think that culturally that, we were used to that before we walked in here just because coming from bear guiding families and fishing, you have our, the people before us uh, had uh, partners every year they put a camp together and they would call up or go get someone fly them in or and you could count on it and that person's skills and reliability and and uh, so it wasn't a foreign thing you know uh and it and it it values lifelong friendships we grew up simultaneous on the island i didn't go to school there and and i didn't really know alvin personally uh, until maybe like 20 years ago. Yeah, but we grew up at the exact same time on the island. And so we had probably our experiences overmatched 85%. So we have a real common, I mean, he can tell a joke with two words that nobody else even understands and I'll fall on the floor laughing because I've got all the background. It's amazing. It's like you two read each other's minds just from how little I know you it must be from growing similar and then sharing that studio space. I would love to know how your ancestral lands inform your right. that you create. How what? Our ancestral impact, how it how it influences us. It has to do with the island. I mean, if you're an island person, you're an island person. Yeah, it's a real sense of place. Yeah. And we were discussing this this morning that, uh, you know, what is ancestor and it's removed from memory. I mean, I mean that level of ancestry, but, and then you come through like grandparents and, and stuff, but I always felt a sense of place and I knew that I would, I always wanted to meet my great grandparents, but they passed in the 1918 flu. But I spent my life taking my grandfather to the gravesite, honoring their their grave. But um, we have these. My family has these islands in Kodiak and uh, from fox farms and seal camps. But um, and we have butter clams, and I know I'm digging the same clams my ancestors did on the same beach. You know, and I know that uh, the rocks haven't moved, you know, navigating. And I know our, our 
lousy weather still come from the same direction. And all these things that I'm getting immersed in as, as growing up was the same, except I have an outboard motor, you know, and, and uh, things like that. Technology has changed. So in a way you feel the sense of place that there's a connection that way. And it can't help it affect things you make. I mean, to me, I always think of, if we got a storm coming in from the Northeast and you're in a small skiff, you look at the color of that water out there and if it's a dark brush of blue, you got about 20 minutes to get, get out, out of here. here. <laughs> you know, and so those things were no different than my ancestors. And if I put brush and blue in my painting, it means shit's gonna happen, you know, soon, back up the family, let's get out of here. But it might only mean something to me and that's okay. You know, at least to me, I spiritually loaded that, selected that color. It's, it, it, it really is about the island for me. Um, I went K through 12 in Seattle, uh, but I came home every summer and fished with dad and, and we, we had a saner. And, and so I put 13 years in on the boat, started commercial fishing when I was 10, like all the other boys out of the village. And so you have this rhythm and this this idea, but but for me, you you can sit on a beach, and you can sit on a lawn, and you can look out across Marmot Bay, and you're looking at exactly what your ancestors looked at. And from an artistic standpoint, and I've actually done this, is literally sit and close your eyes and imagine what they saw, um, where were the colors? What colors did they see? Well, there, there's, there's no fluorescence. <laughs> I mean, and so you start running back over source and you're down into flowers, a feather off a bird, uh, a sky, and, and the sky is different. There's not the pollution that we have today. So the color in the sky is different at different times of the day. Um, and, and so that palette that you begin to think in sets you in a time frame. And, and so it helps me when I work with colors on my masks. And sometimes uh, I, will abs I will try and only use those hues that you could envision if you were sitting on a log in, in 1750. And, and, and looking out and, and all you can see is, is what you've got. So, so it's those kind of things. And, and it's also walking, walking on the trails. You, you know that your father walked there and you know that your grandfather walked there. In fact, you may know that all four of your great grandfathers walked there. We're, we, we often think of our great grandfather but we had a bunch of them. I mean, there's multiples in there, and, and uh, but we have a tendency to try and limit it to one or whatever personality-wise. But there's a bunch of them, um, and I I think about those things, and it does influence it. Where was the danger? What 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 did you look over your shoulder for when you were on the water? What did you watch for? Uh, how did you read the water? Um, I, I remember one time I was on a boat in, in the Seattle area with, with uh, a relative, non-indigenous non relative, and, and we're pounding up the middle of the channel. And I asked the guy, I said, uh, do you have a chart? I mean, over there, are there any rocks over there? And he said, no, no, and we're just pounding and he had to slow down. And I said, well, why don't you move over there and run in the lead? And he thought that was a brilliant idea. <laughs> It never crossed his mind. And, and you're, when you're born to that, you're raised with that, it's, it's a world that does influence you, does. Long answer to a simple question. No, that was beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I would love to know how your ancestors guide you in the traditional versus uh, balance, where do you draw the line for modern ideas and tools while still incorporating the old tech tradition? 
<laughs> I, uh, my education with, with vis our visual ancestry uh, was a lot different uh, because a lot of the lutic imagery didn't come out with, in the public till the early 90s. And uh, through uh, doctoral candidates and Dr. Lydia Black and with some other scholars, Ellen Smyanov and Harry. But, so although I was from the same place, I had no, I probably never saw a Lutic mask until early 90s. But I had all these experiences and was making stuff. So my, my visual stimulus beyond family being there was, uh, I had abstract heroes, you know, uh, very blue chip artists and stuff, but I take the content from home from having a sense of place. And it was a big, I just mix them up together, you know? And uh, so that was, you know, in a way it worked for me, you know? And then when I do make a mask or something, you can tell it's mine. <laughs> But I do study some of this stuff. I think it's quite, the technology is quite fascinating. And I'm kind of proud of the way things were, were done on the island, you know, from, from how to, there's a lot behind just the handle of a, a paddle, you know, that makes a whole bunch of sense. And you just think how, how smart these people were a long, long time ago, you know, how efficient and economical, uh, I don't know if I answered the question. It, 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 the, the argument between um, traditional, authentic, I love that word, authentic, um, and, and contemporary, uh, you know, you make an argument that all art that's made today is contemporary art, period. Just by virtue of the time it's made. By definition, it's contemporary art. Um, and, and, then there is traditional contemporary art that, and we have some fabulous artists that, that really work at maintaining that, that traditional imagery. Um, I work between the two. I will go from traditional to contemporary, uh, but the construction technique is uniform and it has to, you know, pass the smell test of, of a lutic baseline. Um, people ask me, I, I love it. People will ask, well, do you make your masks in the traditional way? And uh, it's, a, it's a loaded question. So uh, the traditional way. So do I use stone tools? No, I don't use stone tools. So I, I've developed this pat answer. I make my masks exactly like I make my ancestor did. I use the best tools available, which, which is the way it is. Um, I have a few quirks on my masks. I, I, every mask with maybe two exceptions can be danced. So if a mask can't be used in a utilitary manner, in a traditional utilitary manner, it's not a traditional mask. It's for the wall. It's it's Western wall art is, is what I call it. And there's nothing the matter with that. I'm not critical in the slightest. Uh, and most of my masks are on in a wall. But then again, there's a, a, a group that are danced and then there's a group that are actually used in ceremony. And so there's three kind of distinct levels uh, that I do. Um, and, and my goal is to find satisfaction in what I do and to present an art form in some consistency. Perfect. Wow. That, I didn't know that about the three categories, but I did hear you have special lighting in the museum because traditionally they were danced around the fire, so the lighting's different than the traditional sense. Would you mind elaborating on that a little sure. bit? Sure. One, one of the hallmarks of Aleutic masks are this really heavy brow line. It's carved in really, really deep. Uh, and, it, and it's really a hallmark and a distinctive uh, cut line or definitive cut line of our, our artwork. 
And that kind of always made me scratch my head as to why that was so. And um, one day, um, Will Anderson and I were in France and uh, I was uh, looking at the masks that were exhibited and the mask collection from Boulogne Samir. By the way, I can't say enough for that museum people. Those people at that museum, I'm telling you, as far as I'm concerned, they're the best in the world because they just let us look at the collection. They'll bring it out of storage. They put it on tables for us, give us white gloves, walk away. Let us really examine fabulous people just can't say enough. Well, this collection of masks was taken to Paris for an exhibit. And in the exhibit, it was lit uh, very, very dark, and very almost kind of spooky kind of lighting and whatnot. But it was top lit. And I'm looking at these brow lines and when they're top lit, they cast shadows over the face. And it kind of like clicked on that they were bottom lit. Now, Western lighting is almost all top, top down. It's, that's the way we like things. And the mass looks different when it's got top down. And when you light it from the bottom up, these brow lines come in really strong, the nose comes in, the mouth, and our petroglyphs on the island, of which we have many, uh, often have no top line. They merely have this brow line, nose line, the bottom of the nose shows in the mouth. And that's because when they were danced, they were bottom lit. Just like Southeast Mass. Seems More to likely. And, and, but a lot of Southeast Mass, I think, were danced outside. Um, I don't know that. I'm not. Rosita, forgive me. I'm not, a, <laughs> I'm not an authority. I don't pretend to be. It, it's but, a mask outside. Outside mask, right. Uh, but ours were all danced inside to a large degree. I, I suspect there were outside dances, but but the caves where our our hunting fraternities, our whaling fraternities, it was a closed environment. Uh, they had secret societies uh, and they were danced from the inside. So these brow lines become very important. Uh, and I and that was an accidental discovery. Oh my god. Goodness, wow, secret societies and caves, that's amazing. What a, what a fun discovery to find that out. It's so neat. So just hearing you talk, you're finding all these discoveries when about your culture just through the art. I would love to know what your biggest inspirations are, whether that's people, places, um, nature, anything along those lines. Life. Biggest one inspiration oh. life <laughs> yeah getting up and sucking the air yeah <laughs> yeah the culmination of all the years yeah i i think this morning we discussed uh there was a question that i, I don't think has come up yet about uh would you if you had to do it all over would you just make art all day and, and probably i felt no um and uh, just because you don't you don't have this vast experience like being on boats and doing this hunting and, and, and relationships with people, uh, you don't have the stimulus to to make a bunch of stuff. I mean, you got to get out there and, and and do things, you know, and get go over your hip boots. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the extremities and, and those moments that, you know, that, that influence you. And, and it's part of life. It's part of living. It's, it's you know, getting, getting up and uh, growing up. If youth is wasted on the young, I've argued that sometimes, uh, you know, wisdom is wasted on the elders. You got you to give back. <laughs> you got to give back. There, oh, there is one thing I want to share with you. There is a misgiving about Aleutic masks. And people say, and, and anthropologists, and, and there's a grain of truth, that they were all burned. They were burned. And there's no Aleutic masks because they were all burned. They burned them. And that's not exactly true. What that was about 
is transformation. That spirit of the mask and that power that was instilled in that mask, that message that was instilled, needed to move into the next world, of which we had five. And the form of transformation was fire. It was not destruction. Western society looks at fire as destruction. So, so too often people assume because the mask was burned, it was destroyed. That's not true. It was transformed. And there's a real distinction between the two. Wow, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> um, just commented and she said, Alvin, your art from your art draws from your life experiences, hunting and fishing on the island. Whereas Harry's art is based on a tradition that's almost become extinct. Your exposure came through museums. How do these different experiences affect the development of your art in your relationship to your art? Would you say your art is integrated into your culture or a reflection of your culture? Ah, good question. Both. Probably both. So reflecting and integrated. Uh, it, I'm from the same place, but I, I think when I get stimulated by a piece, that I'm somewhat familiar with the content or context. It's fun when you realize I've never thought of it that way. It's informational. And uh, does that make sense? No. <laughs> <laughs> work with it, work with it. Yeah. So, uh, wow. It's, it's definitely both. Yeah. I, I mean, your animals, absolutely are the evolving uh, fauna of the island. I mean, and you find great strength in that. And it comes out of that hunting background of your grandfather's guiding. And, and you know, I, my father was a guide also. And, and, but, but it's an integrated piece and it comes back out through expression. So is it an expression of the culture or is it? Yeah, it's both, it's both. And you stay in that groove pretty, pretty good. There, there's certain things that are more, well, really fun to paint. Like uh, when I was young and, and helped my grandfather seal hunt, um, I had some really intimate experiences. Like I'd put my grandfather off in the rock with a rifle and he'd be sitting up and I'd have, my job as a boy was to keep that dory from banging the rocks and making noise. And I'd spot a baby seal asleep four feet from the skiff. And I, being a guy, I, I tapped it on the stomach with the oar and probably gave it the, <laughs> scared me. But <laughs> that's a little thing she'd find too. But now I'm painting, I like painting seals because the patterns of a seal are a perfect form for a real explosion of abstract art. Make it any way you want. You know, it's hard to miss. And, and so that becomes, just in a painting sense, a, a real fun thing, image to work with. And, uh, you know, um, I'm not sure if I'm getting to this question. I, think. I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's, it's both. It, it, and some of it has to do with the concept of contemporary. I mean, you have to live in today's moment. So are you reflecting yesterday or are you reflecting traditional flow uh, within the context of today? So, so, so it's really both. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of value in having those experiences I was just discussing because I can look at a piece some drew a seal and just say, that person doesn't know seals. Well, I see that in boats all the time, paintings yeah. of boats, the perspective. It, not that I'm know. better, it's just, boy, you'd be doing a lot different if you, you had to fillet a few seals and feel the muscles and skull and drag them up a beach. I don't think any artist can step out of their identity. 
art is a reflection of your identity. And if you haven't lived it, you haven't, you haven't gone there, uh, you don't do it. I, I couldn't imagine doing enamel, baked enamel, and, and yet it's a fabulous art form in Russia. And I've seen it done and it's just like incredible. But, but it's, not, it's not part of my yeah. world. Um, uh, religious art, I mean, uh, there is some Muslim design work that's just breathtaking, but I don't relate to it. I can appreciate it, but it's not me. So it's, I mean, the production of art can only be the sum total of the individual in the moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. That, that leads us to our very last question. And this is from Kari again. And she's wondering, what do you think are some of the major challenges and opportunities for Alaska Native artists in this city? Good question. Challenges and opportunities. I think we've come through a fabulous period of, of identity. I think the last 25 years, 30 years for Native artists or Indigenous art, let me put it that way, Indigenous art has been very good. And it's been a result of the maturity of the state, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, there's uh, tr tribal uh, revivals. There's just, just, it's just been a very, very Renaissance period. Uh, going forward, I, I don't know, I, I worry. Um, I don't see a lot of professional artists. I see, I see a lot of craft. I see a lot of talent, but that commitment to get up in the morning and go to work and be an artist, uh, there's probably what, 100, 150 in the state maybe, if I'm guessing. And I think that's the challenge. I think the challenge in deciding you want to be an artist uh, is it, it's a tough one. I had a very, very difficult time because uh, I had careers all over the map. Uh, and, but, but the art was always the, the thread or the, the line, the rope that, that kept me focused. Um, and, and America as a country loves art, but they don't appreciate arts. Um, the, the, the artists that you can name by name in America are not very many, but you can recognize the work. So as opposed to Europe, I love showing in Europe because they folk, they, they want to know about the artist. They're very, very, very particular about that, that artist. Uh, America wants to basically make sure that it goes with the couch. That's cold, but. No, I, if, I don't know, we have time. Um, I remember when I was doing graduate work, I'd go home for the summer and fish or whatever, but I got tired of this one joke. People say, well, either what'd you learn this year or, uh, you know, I, I have a painting job for you. And I'd say, oh, what's that? My, said, my house. Yeah. And so I got that question a couple years later and I, I got a painting job for you. And it says, what, this is my house. And I finally turned, and I said, you can't afford me. You know, so, um, yeah, if painting, uh, art is a vocation is, it's not easy, but it's certainly re rewarding. And personally, I, I'm such a, I'm so glad there is such a thing as art. You know, there's no right way or wrong way. You know, just, just start your trails and start making things. I think the most important thing for artists today is to go to work. Yeah, you got to show up. You got to show up. And, and too many times I hear, well, I'm just not in the mood. So clean brushes or do something, but go to work. Go to work. And it will come. It does. You, know, you, you don't have to have that aha moment before you start. Just, just stay busy. And don't drink and draw. 
<laughs> yeah, don't drink and draw. Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> I don't know. In my case, it might be an improvement. Yeah, 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 it could be an improvement. Oh, well, I thought that was great advice because I know in many of our indigenous cultures, we're not supposed to create art when we're in a good space. But there's other things you can do, like you said, like clean your brush or do things that's not directly going into that. So I think that's great advice for artists just starting out or or even up far along in their journey, just stay busy however you can. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining me here for this Sealaska interview. And it's been such a pleasure to get to know you both and hear all of your rich um, culture and story and everything you had to share. If you have anything you'd like to say before you go, um, feel free to, and then we'll sign out. No, I just. Hi, Facebook people. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for sitting through it if you actually sat through the whole thing. Do you have rewards for those individuals? They should get them. We get air mileage. Yeah, well, air mileage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was fun. Yes. That's important in life. Have fun. All right. Everybody, have a great weekend and stay safe. Stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye.